Good morning once again. This is Sunday, August the 9th, 2020. This lesson is being recorded for the, our, our uh, online assembling together since we are still in a situation where we are, are not assembling, coming together at our regular location because of the concerns with the coronavirus and and restrictions where the government is concerned. Uh, look for changes in the very near future as uh, we strive to make whatever accommodations we can so that we will be able to come together because we firmly believe that is what God wants us to do. And it is absolutely something that uh, that now that it's lacking, uh, we ought to appreciate more the very purpose of doing that. So Lord willing, in the near future, at least for some of our services, we will be able to come together here at our location once again and worship God together. But in the meantime, we're going to continue as we have been doing over the course of the past few weeks, uh, studying God's Word together while still apart uh, through this particular means here. And so I want to ask you to turn your Bibles this morning to the book of Matthew chapter 5, where we are going to be continuing our study of the Sermon on the Mount. And this is a part of our theme for the year that we are dealing with the teachings of Jesus, a theme that's going to go through 2021. We're going to devote much of the rest of this year uh, with a, a few uh, uh, Sunday set aside, we're going to devote most of this year to the rest of the Sermon on the Mount so that we can develop that in detail. And it certainly is a great sermon that Jesus presented for us to consider. And you may recall that what we've dealt with over the course of the past few weeks is Jesus in Matthew 5 and in verse number 20 uh, has given what I believe to be the theme of this sermon where he said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And this might prompt some to say, how can our righteousness be greater than our religious leaders when we see how righteous they are as they live their lives? And in, in essence, what Jesus does for much of the rest of, of Matthew chapter 5, he says, let me show you how. And it is done in the form of a series of six different, um, you have heard it said, but I say to you, uh, a form. And uh, that's what we have been discussing over the past several weeks. We've actually noted three of these where uh, Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall not murder. And he said, but, but I say to you, don't even be angry that you're in danger of judgment with that. We talked about a couple of weeks ago, uh, you have heard that it said, you shall not commit adultery. Uh, but I tell you, don't even look at a woman to lust after her. And then last week we talked about uh, uh, uh when you divorce, you need to give a certificate of divorce. You have heard that said. Uh, but I say to you, uh, don't divorce uh, with one exception. And we discussed all of those things last week. And that brings us to the next point that we want to deal with. Uh, and that is dealing with oaths as found in Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. And that's where we're going to take our lesson this morning. So I want you to turn your Bibles there, and we're going to start reading this particular text, Matthew 5, beginning in verse number 33. And what we read there is, Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. So here we have Jesus dealing with an individual who takes an oath where God is concerned. And uh, it, it was apparent from the Pharisees and also from the law of Moses that you needed to take oaths seriously. And, and I believe that there was a sense in which the Jews understood that, at least to a degree. And that's what we find some examples of even in this text. So we find here that Jesus said, you shall not swear falsely, but you shall perform your oaths. And understand that this very much was a, a part of the law of Moses, and it was clearly taught 
in a number of different places. In the Law of Moses in the book of Leviticus, a book that was written uh, to the priests and dealing with moral purity among the children of Israel, you read there, You shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane, profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. And so the warning is, don't you dare misuse my name. Don't you use my name and then lie about it. Numbers 30, 30 and in verse number 2. If a man makes a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. And you'll notice in that text, and we'll visit it a little bit later, it's not just an oath to the Lord. In Deuteronomy 23 and in verse 21, you read there, uh, this is Moses giving his, uh, his uh, second giving of the law as he's about to die. He says, when you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and it would be a sin to you. So again, the warning is there. You make a vow to the Lord, you better keep it. And that's the point that is being made over and over. And there's multitudes of passages in the Law of Moses and throughout the Old Testament that emphasize this idea. Uh, other passages getting outside of the actual law over in the book of Ecclesiastes that now, we've been studying on Sunday nights, but you may recall uh, several months ago, maybe even last year, uh, we dealt with Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and in verse number 2 where, where Solomon there said, Do not be rash with your mouth and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God, for God is in heaven and you on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. And then in verse 5, he says, When you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it. For he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. Better not to vow than to vow and not pay. Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the messenger of God that it was an error. Why should God be angry at your excuse and destroy the work of your hands? And so the warning is there, you know, uh, vows are to be taken very, very seriously. And, and you can even go to the, uh, uh, the, the prophets. For example, you have in Hosea 4, verses 1 and 2, and, and Hosea is a prophet who was actually sent from Judah to Israel, warning Israel of upcoming captivity if they don't repent. And, and one of the sins that was associated with, with Israel and later on with Judah, and I believe one of the, the, the causes of their downfall, was their, uh, uh, their failure to keep their word. In Hosea 4 and verses 1 and 2, you read here, hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, for the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying, killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break all restraint with bloodshed upon bloodshed. Among the things that are said there is there's no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. And by swearing and lying, they, they, they would make promises and they would be lying in those things. God took that seriously. In the book of Jeremiah, here this is pointing toward uh, Judah or, or southern Israel after northern Israel has been carried away. And the warning is that Judah is about to be carried away into captivity as well. And in Jeremiah 5 verses 1 and 2, we find in that particular text that one of the sins that was associated with them is that they swore falsely. So let's go over here to Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah chapter 5, and this is early on in warning the children of Israel. And we find there it says, Run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. See now and know, and seek in her open places, if you can find a man, if there is anyone who executes judgment, who seeks truth, and I will pardon her. Though they say, As the Lord lives, surely they swear falsely. So the condemnation was that, that they take oaths, uh, they swear to God, they swear to the Lord, but they're lying. And that's the problem. So, so, so understand in the law of Moses, the warning was very, very clear.
And, and the emphasis in all of these texts uh, is truthfulness. To turn over to, to Psalm 15 for a moment, and, and this is one of my favorite psalms where we find David is describing the one who will be able to enter into the presence of God. You read there in chapter 15 and in verse number 1, you read there where it says, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? The idea is who, who can be in the presence of God? And he goes on and he, and he describes various qualities. He who walks uprightly, works righteousness, speaks the truth in his heart. He does not backbite with his tongue, does, do, do, uh, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord, he who swears to his own hurt and does not change. This is talking about somebody that when he makes a promise to somebody, he's going to keep it. And the whole point of the law of Moses, and when, when that was being taught, all throughout the history of Israel, the point was, is God wants you to be truthful. God wants you to keep your vows. God wants you that when you say something, he wants you to be faithful and to faithfully carry out the vows that you have made. And, and, and that's actually the point that Jesus was emphasizing as well. But now you might ask the question, well, okay, that's what the law of Moses said. How had they corrupted the law of Moses? Well, actually, in a number of ways. You know, number one, uh, they could have said that, O's, uh, that only O's had to be truthful. In other words, as long as you didn't say, I swear, uh, it was okay to lie about it. And, and uh, uh, you can search the Old Testament, and you're not going to find that that uh, that's a rule that they were permitted to live by. Something else that they might have done is they might have qualified what constitutes an oath. And we're going to look at a little while in Matthew 23, verses 16 through 22. But, but what you find there is, is that many of the leaders, they would manipulate words. You, you might call it a code of some sort. And, and if for some, for some reason, somebody did not understand the wording they were using, they could know that they were lying about it. You know, very similar to we sometimes hear, hear about kids that when they would say something, if they had their hand behind their back and they were crossing their fingers, you know, uh, uh, th th that that meant it was okay to lie about it or something to that effect. They would qualify that, you know what, if I don't use a certain words, then uh, it's okay for me to break my promise or to break my oath. And associated with that, they would only bind oaths that were to the Lord. If you said, I swear to the Lord, or I swear to, uh, to God, or I swear by Jehovah God, if you invoked the name of God, then you were obligated to keep it. But if you didn't invoke the name of God, you were not obligated to keep it. And we're actually going to see some examples of that in our text here in a minute, some of the things that people would swear by, and, and, and the implication may be that they didn't necessarily keep their word when they swore by those things. And something else that, uh, that I just thought about, I don't know that this is exactly uh, the point that is being made here, but, but when they divorced, divorced the wife of their youth. You find, and we, we dealt with this last week in Malachi 2, verses 14 and 15, that God hates divorce. And he talks about how it does violence to the land and so on, and, and how you've done violence to, to, to the wife of the covenant of your youth. Uh, you, you, you've lied to God about keeping this oath that you made before God that you were going to take your spouse to be with you for the remainder of your life. So those are some ways that they could have been guilty of manipulating the law of Moses. But then what did Jesus say? And this is something that in one sense, it deals with the intent of the law of Moses, but I want you to also note that it goes beyond what the law of Moses actually taught in dealing with this particular subject. Jesus said, I say to you, do not swear at all. 
And I want you to understand that the word swear that is used in this text in the Greek language, it's a word that is talking about taking oaths. And that's the way that it's used. Uh, you know, sometimes in the English language, and I don't know how much we do this anymore, but, but that word swear can mean uh, to, to take an oath, but it can also mean to use profanity. And, you, and when you think about breaking an oath, uh, you know, there's something profane about that. Uh, but the word in the Greek language was talking about an oath, when you actually make an oath. And we're going to find, and we'll, we're going to deal with this a little later on in this lesson, that he, under the old law, there were occasions when swearing or, or, or taking a, an oath or even invoking the name of God was acceptable and it was even accepted uh, or expected in some instances. And we're also going to see some of that in the New Testament. And, and, and I want you to understand that the law of Moses did not teach, do not swear at all. You don't find that anywhere in the law of Moses. And again, we're going to see that as we further develop this particular lesson. So Jesus is saying, do not swear at all. And, and, and we want to talk about what that actually means. Well, he goes on and he gives some examples of it in verses 34 through 36, where he says, you know, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. So the point that Jesus is making here is, you know what, you can play word games all day long, but God sees through what you're doing. You can say, you know, I swear by heaven, or, or, or I, I swear by earth, or, or, or I swear by the city of Jerusalem. And, and uh, somebody that didn't know anybody said, oh, this must be pretty solemn, you know. Uh, but the bottom line is they knew deep down, I wasn't, I'm not swearing in the name of the Lord, or, or uh, maybe they had no intent to keep it, and, and, and they intended to deceive in what they were saying. But Jesus makes the point, uh, you know what, no matter what you swear by, if you really think about it, everything actually belongs to God. You know, he owns everything. Uh, you swear by heaven? Uh, well, where's God's throne at? You know, it's uh, described as in heaven. Uh, you swear by the earth? Well, who made the earth? God did. You swear by Jerusalem? Uh, who, who made that a holy city? It, it is the fact that God's presence was there with the children of Israel. You talk about swearing by your own head. Who gave you life? Who made you in his image? And you can go on and on. You know, so people can say flippantly, well, if I swear by this, it's not that big of a deal. But if I swear by this, and they say something else, it's a bigger deal. Uh, no, that's not the case. Uh, the, the point that Jesus is making when he says don't swear at all is he, he said, you know, when you make an oath, keep your oath. Don't look for loopholes. Don't look for ways to get around anything. I'm reminded again of, uh, of an, another psalm that is dealing with dealing or that is dealing with dwelling in the presence of God over in uh, uh, Psalm 24. And in verse number one, and you find in this particular text here, Psalm 24, and in verse number one, that it says, The earth is the Lord and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. And then he goes on and talks about those who may be in his presence. But he starts off by declaring there, the earth, the earth belongs to God. Everything in it. You go over to Psalm 50 and in verse number 10, and this is a passage where God is describing his greatness. How, how you know what you offer me sacrifices, I don't need them. He goes on and he says there in verse number 10 of that text, uh, uh, Psalm 50 and in verse 10, he says, For he sees wise men die, um, uh, uh, like, likewise the fool and the senseless uh, person perish. And uh, that is not the right verse. Let me find this. Uh, one of the points that is made there is where it says every, oh, I was reading the wrong one. It says every beast of the forest is mine, 
and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. He makes the point there, you know, the, the cattle of a thousand hills, they're mine. Everything belongs to me. So if you swear by something and you think that by doing that, that it gets you out of having to go through the vow because you're not swearing in the name of God, you better think again. And there's another passage that I want to I want to think about along this lines, and this is found over in Matthew 23, and beginning in verse number 16, and and of course this is as uh, on the the final week of the life of Jesus, and and this is where he is just just absolutely castigating the hypocrisy of the scribes and the Pharisees. This is the some of the most harsh language that Jesus uses in all of his teachings that we have recorded. Over and over he calls them uh, hypocrites, and, and he calls them a brood of vipers, and, and he says that you're whitewashed tombs, and all those types of descriptions. And among the things that he says to them is in verse number 16, where he says, Woe to you blind guides who say, Whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obligated to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold of the temple that sanctifies the gold, or, or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is obligated to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore he who swears by the altar swears by it and by all things on it. He who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. So the point that Jesus is making here, and again, this is, this is getting into even more technical language. And it's clear from this text that that the religious leaders, the Jewish leaders, there was some type of a code that if they said this, that they were obligated to keep it where their brethren were concerned. You know, I swear by the gold of the temple. And their Jewish leaders would understand, well, he has to keep this. But he could lie to somebody that was ignorant. I swear by the temple. And they would think, oh, that's serious. But then he turns around and he knows that he's lying because he hasn't swore by the gold of the temple. And this goes back to the, the great point. Uh, and really, you think about this. Jesus is making the observation. You all are putting your trust in the material aspect of it, the gold of the temple. But what is it that makes that gold hallowed? It's, it's the fact that God's presence is found in the temple. What is it that makes the gift on the altar acceptable? It's the fact that the altar, uh, the altar is there from God, and God is accepting that sacrifice. So it's the place that makes the contents holy. So they were actually getting things backwards as they were manipulating their oaths and trying to find ways to get out of having to, to, to tell the truth and possibly to actually outright and overtly deceive people. It's very possible that that's what they were doing. So, so Jesus is saying, you don't do that. You don't do that. Instead, let me uh, tell you what you need to do. He says, you just simply need to let your yes be yes and your no, no. And he goes on and he says, whatever is more than these is from the evil one. You know, if you say, yes, I will do this, you need to do it. If you say, no, I'm not going to do it, then, I, then you're not going to do it. And if you're lying about it, if you're twisting it or manipulating it in any way whatsoever, it's of the devil. That's the point that Jesus is making. You let your word be your bond. You be truthful. You be a person of integrity. And hear me, even if it hurts, even if it costs, costs you to keep your word, you, 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 make, a pro, you make a promise and, and, and you find out that it's more difficult than you realize. You found out that it comes at a greater cost than what you thought it was going to be. You made a promise. You keep your word even if it hurts. And if you make a promise 
uh, the one whom you spoke to, he ought to, he ought to with confidence be able to believe you just simply because you said it. And that's really the bottom line. That's what Jesus means when he says, you let your yes be yes, and you let your no be no. And you can go to James chapter 5 and in verse 12, and, and, and the whole point here is you find this in, in the New Testament, uh, uh, beyond the Gospels. And as I've pointed out before, I believe the Gospels are written for Christians uh, in, in many ways, and to convert people to Christ. But the bottom line is, you go into the epistles in James 5 and in verse 12, you read there, Above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. Keep your word. It's really that simple. We just need to understand that God hates lying. Uh, uh, he always has. I mean, you think about this. What caused the first sin? What led to the first sin? It was a lie. In John 8 and in verse number 34 or 44, Jesus there speaking to the religious leaders talked about how you were of your father the devil. And he goes on, he says he was a murderer. And, 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 he, and he was a liar from the beginning and a father of lies. Satan is the originator of lies. And that's the point that you have there. And I want you to know that this is something that was, it was emphasized over and over and over the Old Testament. Turn over to the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs 6, we find here beginning in verse 16, it says, These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Listen to this. Seven things God hates. A proud look, number two, a lying tongue, number three, hands that shed innocent blood, number four, a heart that devises wicked plans, that's deep deceitfulness, lying, F uh, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows, sows discord among brethren. At least three of those, and you might even make a case for four or five of them, are, are dealing with those who are not truthful with their words. Over in Proverbs 12, and in verse number 22, we read in that text, it says, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal truthfully are his delight. Turn over to the New Testament. In Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse number 25. And the point here is this has always, always been God's uh, demand. In Ephesians 4 and in verse number 25, Therefore putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Speak the truth to your neighbor. It's just that simple. Don't lie. And finally in Revelation 21 and in verse number 8, and when I say finally, this is, this is by no means an exhaustive list. But here we read, Revelation 21 and verse 8, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. All liars. Liars are going to be there along with murderers and fornicators and, and everybody else. All liars. And I find it in, interesting that he emphasizes all. You know, how many people try to do word games and say, well, it wasn't actually a, 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 a real lie. I just kind of manipulated the words a little bit. You know, Jesus is saying, what's he saying? You let your yes be yes and you let your no be no, nothing more. We need to be people of integrity and truth. And that needs to be a characteristic that is identified with being a Christian. If somebody knows you are a Christian, they ought to know that you are a person of truth and integrity. And when you say something, they know that you're going to do what you say you're going to do. It wasn't too many decades ago where it, it, at least it used to be said that business could be done with a handshake. People would make an agreement, people would make a loan, and they would reach out their hands and they would shake. And it didn't matter if there was a contract involved. His word was his bond. And the fact that he shook your hand, that was enough. And 
that's the idea of this integrity that we're talking about. Today, everything has to be written in contracts. And you know, when you go to buy a car, you have to you ha you have to to slay half a forest to sign uh, to to sign the papers that are necessary uh, to ensure that you're not going to find a way to get out of your contract. And so, and then, how many people are there that that they have signed a contract and they've made agreements, they've made financial agreements, they've made other agreements? And then they look for some kind of a loophole or some way to get out of it. You know, what, what's wrong with a Christian declaring bankruptcy? Well, you're trying to get out of your obligations. And I know that uh, I'm not discussing everything associated with that. Uh, but the point is, is you've made obligations to pay your debts. And if you're failing to pay your debts, you got a problem there. So let your yes be yes and your no, no. But somebody might ask, well, what if I can't keep my vows? You know, I, 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 I've said something and, and, and I just absolutely cannot do it. Well, there may, and I hesitate to use that word, there may be a circumstance where that's the case. But I want you to know that, that it is a rare exception. Maybe you're in a situation where you've, you've vowed to do something and, and as you begin to do it, you find out it's absolutely impossible. You absolutely cannot do that. Or, or you discover that by doing it, it's actually going to be harmful uh, in, in accomplishing this. And I'm not talking about just harmful to you, but, but maybe harmful to, to somebody else or, or, or some kind of a situation. And, and you, realize, you realize that you shouldn't have made that vow in the first place. And that's really the point in this. And so I want you to understand there may be some circumstance like that, but even if that's the case, you need to realize that there's repentance that needs to take place. You've sinned. Uh, you made a vow. You made a promise, and you've had to break that promise. And, and that is a sin where God is concerned. And because it's a sin, you, you need to repent of that. And that might mean that you need to go to the offended party and acknowledge why you cannot keep the promise that you made, why you cannot keep the vows that you made. And didn't we talk about that earlier in Matthew 5, 23 and 24? You bring your gift to God to offer it to him, and you remember your brother has something against you. Take care of it, and then come offer your gift. You may be in a situation where you need to get forgiveness from the one who you made the promise to that you, you've had to break that promise. So don't think that this is an easy thing and the whole point of that, you know, what if you made the vow rashly? Well, if you did it rashly, uh, there's consequences to that. There's still sin involved. And that's the point to remember in that. Well, that brings me to one more question that I want to deal with before I wrap this lesson up or as I wrap this lesson up. And, and that is somebody say, well, what about swearing in court? People will look at what Jesus said here, and they will look at the passage in James chapter 5 that says, do not swear at all, let your yes be yes and your no, no. And, and they will say that, you know what, uh, in court you're supposed to swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth if you're a witness. Or, or if you're a juror, uh, you have to take that oath that you will abide by the laws of the land, or maybe somebody that has a job, a police officer or, or, or a soldier, and I'm sure there's many other jobs where you have to take an oath. And in many instances, uh, at least it used to be you would swear that you were going to uphold the Constitution of the United States. And there are some that look at these verses and say, can I do that? Or, or doesn't, doesn't these verses say that it's wrong for me to do that. And my answer to that is I don't think that that's what the text is talking about. And I want you to understand that in many instances, I know that when you go to court, they, and it's because of this, they will say something to the effect of, do you swear or affirm? And they will allow you to quote unquote affirm instead of swearing. But I want you to understand really is what's the difference? Uh, what's the difference in essence of what you are doing? You're putting yourself under oath with God as a witness that you are going to be truthful and that you're going to tell uh, the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And so so uh, uh, you look at that regardless, uh, you, you have to verify that you are going to under oath, that you're going to be truthful in what you are saying or what you are doing.
But there's some other things I want you to consider about this. You know, uh, in Ecclesiastes 5, verses 4 and 5, that, that we read a little earlier there, the point that is made there is when you make an oath to God, do not delay to, to pay it, but rather you are to take that vow seriously. And that's one of the points that we consider as we give consideration to this. But the point that I want you to note there is that Solomon doesn't say it's wrong to make a vow. He's just saying if you make a vow, if you swear in the presence of God, be serious about it. Mean it. That oath need, means to needs to mean something. And I can add to that regardless of the wording that you use. If you make a vow, keep your vow. If you keep your vow, you have not sinned in swearing to do something. And that's the point to understand in that. And again, we, we can go back to uh, the verses that we read earlier in Numbers 30 and in verse 2, where he says, if a man makes a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement, he shall not break his word. If you swear with an oath, he doesn't say that it's wrong to swear. He just says, if you do, you're obligated to keep it. And that's the point. A couple of other considerations. Do you realize over in... Uh, Hebrews chapter 6 and beginning in about verse 13 and and here the Hebrew writer is making reference to Genesis 22 where Moses was or Abraham was willing to offer up his son Isaac and uh, the angel of the Lord stops him from killing his son and after that it says he swore to him with an oath and I want you to notice in Hebrews 6 and verse 13 it says for when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiply, multiplying I will multiply you. And so that after he had patiently and dirty obtained the promise, for men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by these two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie we might have strong consolation and he goes on but I want you to notice says God swore by himself you think uh, you, if swearing is wrong in every circumstance can God swear and, and that's what you have as an example there and incidentally when it talks about by two immutable things in which it is impossible to lie. The point is, is because of the faith of Abraham, God not only made a promise to Abraham, number one, but he also confirmed it with an oath. He swore by himself that he would do it. So here you find God keeping an oath, swearing by himself. One more example we might consider is over in Matthew chapter 26. And here's where we find Jesus. He's before the Sanhedrin uh, being tried as, as, they're, as uh, they're ready to send him to Pilate to have him crucified and so on. But they've got to have something to say. So the high priest says to Jesus there in verse number 63, uh, the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. I want you to note that he says there, I put you under oath. And that's a form of the same word that Jesus was talking about in Matthew 5 in our text, the word swearing and so on. And I want you to notice in verse 64, it says, Jesus said to him, it is as you said. Jesus answered that. Under oath. Jesus answered. You also have a number of examples of Paul uh, throughout his letters. Romans 1 and verse number 9, he talks about how God is my witness. In Romans 9 and 1, I, I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying. 2 Corinthians 1, 23, moreover, I call God as witness against my soul. That's like, I, like saying, I swear in the presence of God. <coughs> and he's talking about how I'm being truthful. And over and over and over and over, Paul over and over says, I'm telling the truth. God is my witness. I'm willing to make an oath that what I'm telling you is from God. It's not something that I have deceitfully made up. 
So when you put all of these things together, it, it, it becomes pretty clear that the point that Jesus is making there is keep your word. Uh, that's the bottom line. It, it, when he says do not swear at all, put it in context. Don't, don't, don't swear if, if, if your swearing means that, uh, means that you're going to lie, uh, if, if it means that you're going to manipulate the words and say it's okay as long as I'm saying this. No, that's not acceptable. We need to always be of such a character that you don't need to be put under an oath to tell the truth, and that's the bottom line. But if you are put under an oath, you keep that oath and, and you tell the truth and you understand that God will accept nothing less than that. And if for some reason you have to go testify in court or, or, or take an oath as a, as a, as a juror or, or for some other reason and you don't feel comfortable using the term I swear, okay. Well, say I affirm, but know that whether you swear to God and whether you swear in the presence of God or you affirm, God's watching and he expects you to keep your word. And that's really the bottom line in what we find in our text. So I conclude by simply asking you, what does your word mean? Think about that. Is God pleased with the way you act and, and speak and think? Is your word? word your bond. The lesson yours. If you would please bow with me at this time. Our dear God and our Heavenly Father, we come to you once again and as always we are thankful for the abundance of blessings that we enjoy even in these troubling times. It is our prayer that in the very near future we will be permitted to once again assemble together together again as you would have us to do and enjoy the fellowship that you have uh, in your word instructed for for Christians as we come together to worship you and to build up one another. Help that to happen soon. But in the meantime, help us as we live our lives to be men and women of integrity. Help us to put our trust in you and all that we do and help us to let our light shine and to just be different from the world in the way that we speak and in the promises that we make and in the actions that we are engaged in. Go with us now. We ask all these things through your son's name, and amen. And once again, I do want to thank each and every one of you. Uh, I'm honored to have the opportunity to share another portion of God's word with you. If you have questions about anything, feel free to ask. But in the meantime, and until our afternoon lesson, uh, may God be with you through the remainder of this day and through this week. Take care for now.